So we spend most of our time growing mushrooms and mushrooms are a really high value crop that are fairly easy for people to learn to grow and you don't need lots of space for it. Um, but a chat I had with a friend recently has led us to think more broadly about um, which other crops are profitable, what makes a crop profitable in the first place. And we're gonna share that with you in this video. So the friend that Adam had a chat with is um, Richard Perkins and what he does is phenomenal. He runs a 25 acres farm and they basically set it up from scratch in Sweden. And it's a whole range of activities that he's got going on. Um, it's a lot, a lot of the ethos is about making it into a really efficient um, natural habitat. Um, there's a whole ethos behind that. Uh, he also likes to teach what he's doing. He's passionate about small-scale farming and regenerative agriculture. Some of the activities, for instance, that he's got going on is pasture chickens, both for the meat and um, for the eggs. He's got a no-dig market garden and he's got microgreens on the go. And all of this, mind you, he, he grows all of that stuff with sometimes very little daylight, which is absolutely incredible. Um, the other thing to mention is that he pre-sells all of his products. Um, he's got really good business focus and yes I'm, I'm a big fan of the man he likes to share stuff as well so mm. we can all benefit from that so not only were we surprised at uh, the sheer activity rich has got going on in a relatively small space but also how much income he generates from from it too so not all of the space he has is farmed he's also got some forestry there um, so in the space that he's actually actively farming he manages to pull in over 250,000 euros per year and that's a, a fair amount of money considering his team is quite small as well. So it's um, Richard and his partner Johanna, they have a young child as well. So he's also got kind of the family life uh, to take care of. And then he has two uh, full-time seasonal workers that help in the, the short uh, and intense growing season that they have up there in Sweden. It's a pretty amazing setup. So over the past few weeks, Adam and I have been looking at people like this who make it work. And we've been doing some research on the most profitable crops that you can grow. And I can tell you now, right off the bat, that there's just so much to consider when looking at this that the answer might not be a straightforward answer. But we'll come back to that later on. Let's first look at three of these crops. So we'll look at market gardening first. So when I say market gardening, what I mean is that you choose to grow vegetables on a small piece of land, so say a couple of acres. And in fact, I did a growing season at a beautiful market garden in Wales years ago and I love the experience there. Also here on site we've got our mushroom farm in that direction and behind me here you can see some greenhouses and behind that is um, a field that is cultivated as a no-dig market garden so there's rows and rows of vegetables that people sell direct to markets and restaurants and in fact when I did that um, that's growing stint in Wales what we loved most was the connection you have as a farmer with the people on the market. So we would, uh, we would harvest the salads in the, in the morning and go straight to market and it's the freshest thing that you can offer these people. And that's why it's so popular with growers. I mean, you have the direct connection. And for instance, a community supported agriculture scheme, a CSA scheme like the one they run behind us here, um, you know, on an acre of land, you could probably grow between, you could supply 30 to 50 um, boxes per week um, and that's really worthwhile doing if you can get a good price for it as well. Um, that's, that's a common feature yeah. isn't it with market gardening is you tend to be supplying directly to the customer as much as you can to get the highest price for the veg. Yeah. If you start going down the road of supplying wholesalers your price you receive is much much lower and therefore you need to do it at, at increasing scale. Yes, and you lose that connection with the customer, which is also important to keep you, you know, keep you ticking as a grower. That's that's really cool. I mean, a wholesaler would probably not really care if he buys from you or from somebody else, and that's why it's a really good model. But it comes with its own complications, of course. So if you want to look at crop rotation, you need to have some skills. You need to know what you're good at growing, what you're interested in growing. But it's not just that. Your local area needs to want to buy what you're growing. So there's no point in growing a crop that's not very popular where you live. So in terms of numbers then, um, there's a market gardener called Jean-Martin Forche, and he, as a benchmark, puts on um, is it 60, between 60000 and and $100,000 that you can fetch 
per acre, I believe he said. That's, yeah, that's sort of revenue, isn't it? So exactly, that's, uh... revenue, and then with a profit margin of about 45%. Um, and coincidentally, that seems to chime with what Richard, how Richard is running his farm. Um, he also says you need about two full-time people and then two part-time people to make this all work. Mind you, there's a lot of decisions, and we'll come back to that later on, um, there's a lot of decisions that come into play, um, whether you use machinery, whether you use no-dig market gardening, um, whether you decide to sell on the farmer's market, whether you decide to supply wholesalers. So it's not an easy story, but that does give you a bit of a benchmark when it comes to market gardening. Yeah, one thing to say in addition to that is it tends to be a longer-term project. Yes. So it's not such an easy thing to say, I'm just going to try this for the next six months. It's a big yep. commitment. If you decide you want to set up a market garden, you should be looking at least three to five years into the future um, because it'll take that long to establish you know, what crops work well in your area, yep. um, to find routes to market um, and basically just to find your feet with the whole thing. And if you do decide to do that, I'd really recommend spending some time with someone who's been doing it for a while already because you'll learn an awful lot from them uh, before you jump in at the deep end and try it yourself. Yeah, absolutely. It's a good point to make because you can't just um, rent a piece of land and then put in your spreadsheet that you'll have crops at the ready in you know eight weeks' time because there's a lot of steps you need to put in place. In fact, during the research I did, I came across a market garden that was set up in Denmark and it's just set up by two people who just threw themselves at it and it's amazing to um, amazing to watch but they were very aware that the, you need to put a lot of energy just to get to the point where you can sell and produce all of this product so there's a, a bit of a time delay a time lag I mm. guess is what we're saying yep and having said that there's numerous examples of people uh, making a go of market gardening out there so um, do have a look around online if this interests you. It's certainly something which seems to be possible if you've got the drive and the will to put in a lot of work and, and make it happen. For sure. So next up then is um, speciality crops. Yep. So we took a look um, around and there's, there's a fair few crops that kind of fall into this category. So for example, things like saffron, uh, ginseng, um, Wasabi, that's the one I would love to grow. I mean, there's, that's the funny thing when you do this kind of research, you just see something and you think, oh, wow, I, I hadn't considered that, but I do want to grow that. It yeah. doesn't mean that I will grow it. But Cut, cut flowers was another, yeah. uh, chilies. So there's lots of uh, growers that tend to specialise in one fairly high value crop mm. and just do that thing really, really well. Um, so that's another way of, of going about it. And that's one way in which these profitable crops can work out for people. Um, so... Let's take the example of saffron and, and talk a bit about some numbers with that. So saffron is the, the tiny little... Um, uh, it's on the stamen, isn't it? It's on the stamen of, yeah, yeah. of, the, of the saffron crocus. And so um, you tend to harvest it, it gets dried, and it's one of the... I think it is the most valuable um, spice in the world. It fetches around about $2,500 per pound. Uh, which is around about five thousand pounds per yeah, kilo. Yeah, a little bit over that. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's, amazing. I so mean, it, just to think of that. Yeah, that's, it, that's incredible. That's a bunch of money. There's a huge. Yeah, I mean, when you think of a pound of potatoes or something, it's just a totally other end of the spectrum. But the thing is, um, obviously, these stamens are really, really light, especially when they've been dried. So it it actually takes um, the stamens from seventy thousand crocus plants in order to make up a pound of saffron. So that gives you that's, some idea of the, the that's scale. That's a lot of picking, yeah, absolutely. Now, what is cool with this kind of growing, though, that if you compare it to market gardening, where you need to be so hands-on with tending to your crops, is this has got a section where you need to plant all those crocuses, and then you leave them to it, and then you, um, you need to harvest them. So there's only two sections, really, where it's Very labour-intensive. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But then in between your crop kind of does the work for you. There's some irrigation yeah. and, and kind of pest control potentially, um, but the bulk of the labour input is at the start and at the end. Yeah. So if you contrast that to market gardening where it's a lot of labour all season round and you're continually taking one crop out and replacing it with another, um, it's a lot of manual input. Uh, growing a, a kind of a cash crop or speciality crop like this can be a lot less um, time input that goes into it across the whole season and you'll have these peaks in time as well so the the labor cost can be a lot lower basically that's right and maybe for those reasons you i think you also found that it's kind of on the up at the moment isn't it yeah what was uh, really interesting because when i first saw this idea that uh, saffron was a 
a profitable crop, I thought, oh, that's such a niche thing. Surely, you know, nobody's really actually doing that. But actually, it turns out that over the last five or ten years, this has become a really popular uh, thing for people to set up um, all across the US, Canada, Europe, New Zealand, Australia. There's increasing numbers of saffron farmers. That's interesting, isn't it? Because traditionally, I would have thought the Middle East is that sort of the climate where you would. Which is where this, yeah. traditionally, yeah, I think 80 to 90 percent of all saffron is grown in Iran. Um, but I came across one interesting statistic, which was that there are now 100 saffron farms that have set up in the US in the last five years. Um, so that gives you some idea that this is kind of a growing thing. And you can see why, because there's you know, increasing interest from some higher end restaurants and caterers yes, yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and retailers as well to buy from local producers. So there are some farms which are really marketing themselves as US grown yeah. saffron and finding a market for that. The US actually imports a huge amount of um, saffron every year. Uh, they, in 2016, they imported 46 tons of saffron. So we were saying tons before, of saffron. yeah, it's a, it's that's, a, that's a huge amount yeah, of yeah. Uh, product. So um, that surprised me, um, which these things often do when you start digging into them. Yeah, absolutely. So it's obviously a really profitable crop in terms of the price you receive per pound. Um, but the thing is, is you're going to need to do it on a fairly big scale if you want to turn over kind of a large amount of money. So I think I came across a statistic with something along the lines of one acre of saffron will yield you in the first year around about two pounds of two pounds in weight of saffron. And in the fourth year, you'll be looking to yield more like six pounds of saffron. OK, yeah. So after four years or so, you're looking at about what was it then? Thirty thousand dollars or so per acre. Yeah that you get, which is good, absolutely, but it doesn't, if you compare it to, for instance, the market gardening gross income of between 60000 to $100,000, it doesn't quite reach those levels, but at the same time, I think it just requires less labour. And probably and less investment as and well. less investment. Less yeah, infrastructure. Possibly, possibly. Um, so. so mostly it's grown outside, you don't need large polytunnels, yeah. you don't necessarily need a tractor, although it probably would help if you're planting a, a load of them out. Yeah. Um, so the, this is the kind of thing when you dig into the detail you start to realise it's not that easy to compare crop for crop because there's so many intricacies between them. Yes, absolutely, yes. So moving on, let's have a look at uh, the third crop that we want to talk about today and that's microgreens. Yes, I'm excited about this one because this is actually something that um, I mentioned earlier on in the video that when you look at this research and you think, oh yeah, I want to grow wasabi and all that sort of stuff. Um, this crop is actually one that we decided that we will grow and that's microgreens. It's got a lot of commonalities with mushroom growing in that um, you don't need any land, of course, which, you know, you don't need a lease of land in that case, or you don't need to own land. You can grow it on a small space, you can grow it vertically. So it really piqued our interest in that. And luckily we, um, we were able to speak to two seasoned microgreen growers and that sort of spurred us on even more, hasn't it? Yeah, well, the thing that's most interesting, well, there's a number of things that are interesting. One of them is the, the high uh, net profit per kilo is, is really quite interesting it's around about 75 percent so you remember when we mentioned market gardening we said there was a, a net profit so that's you know the profit left from the income that you make minus all the operating or growing costs mm -hmm. and with market garden that was about 45 percent that you'd have left over as net profit and with microgreens it's more like 75 percent so it's a huge difference and it just opens your eyes to the the fact that some crops really are more profitable than others microgreen seems to be an extreme example yeah. for that yeah absolutely and the other thing that um, interests me with microgreens is that from what we can see now it is fairly easy and uncomplicated to set up so you don't like i said you don't need any land but also you just need a few um, relatively inexpensive bits of kit and that makes it a really easy gateway enterprise so what i mean by gateway enterprise is that you can just find your feet if you want to make a living or a side income out of growing food then um, you don't need to go all in you can just sort of start with a few trays and then still generate a decent bit of bit of income yeah you can test it out can't you exactly. you can see if there's demand in your area if you like doing it yep. um, learn the intricacies of the whole process yeah so that's what we'll be doing over the next few months and we'll also make sure to record a video when we'll compare mushroom growing the commonalities and sort of the 
uh, more of the detail about the costs and the outputs and some of our experiences as well. So I'm looking forward to that. Yeah. So just uh, briefly then with the microgreens, here's a few key numbers for you. Um, sale price tends to be around about twenty-five pounds, twenty-five dollars per pound if you're selling direct to um, to customers. That's kind of the retail price, or around about half that, uh, sixty percent of that, if you sell wholesale. So most of the microgreens farms that we came across were looking to sell direct to customers, either at farmers markets or um, some of them sort of did delivery schemes direct to the customer if they were in cities. Uh, a fair few of them also look to sell to restaurants where you can also get a much better price than if you go via a wholesaler. Mm -hmm. um, and the yield in uh, per metre squared, so we're looking really in metre squared rather than acres with um, so the meter microgreens. Squared is 10 square feet, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. So um, the yield is around about 50 kilograms per metre squared. So it's around about 25 pounds per 10 square feet. So it's a huge yield in a small bit of space. So that's the other really big benefit that we can see with microgreens is you don't need all that much space. And um, there's a great video uh, which you may have seen already um, on YouTube from Nate Dodson at Microgreens Farmer. He's got one of these uh, four tier shelving units, um, which he says he can produce $800 of produce per week on. And this is really a bit of shelving you can yeah, fit yeah. In, a, in a spare bit of space, a garage or something at home. Yeah. So the yield and the income per small bit of space is really quite impressive with it. Yes, and what I like about it as well is that you can, with a relatively simple setup, you can have a weekly crop that mm. you can sell. So you've got weekly um, tasks to do, but you've also weekly got money coming in. So it means that you, the cash flow is a lot easier to manage. And the other thing I like about that, during the research we came across the fact that microgreens, so basically what we mean by microgreens is the, the, the plants when it's in the cotyledon stage, I think it's what it's called, so the first true leaf, that's when you harvest it. The, they pack a punch, not only flavor-wise, but also nutrient-wise. So they're pretty mm. healthy. So they've got benefits that you can relay to your customers. It's not all simple, though, is it? Because no. the, the biggest... No, nothing ever is. No. <laughs> the biggest challenge with it is finding a market. Um, so although it sounds great, you know, you get a high price per kilo, why not just grow hundreds of kilos of microgreens? Well, the biggest problem is selling them because... You know, a kilo of microgreens is already a lot of microgreens. Um, so you've got to really make sure that you've got customers that are there ready to buy them from you. Otherwise, you can quite quickly start losing money because, you know, the, you use a lot of seed to grow microgreens. Yes. So if you're, if you're growing, and also a fair bit of compost. So if you're putting your money into these materials and you're then not selling the microgreens and you start doing it at scale, you can pretty quickly uh, come unstuck and start losing money instead of making it. So... You know, our, our advice would be to start small um, if you decide to, to grow them and sort of inch your way up once you have established that there's actually demand in your area. And it seems that most of the, most, most of the successful microgreens farms are in or close to urban areas where there's a larger population uh, in order to be able to shift their, their produce. So that seems pretty key. So there we go. We've looked at three crops in a fair bit of detail some of the numbers around them but also you'll have begun to understand it's not always quite that simple it's not a straightforward answer and we were hoping to give you a really straightforward answer clear cut grow this it's not to be no so there's a few things in particular that kept coming up time and time again and we'll just briefly discuss them now so one of the main things which i talked about there with the microgreens is about making sure you've got a market for your produce so we've come across examples time and time again. We've even done it ourselves. We've done it ourselves for sure. <laughs> More than yeah. once even. Yeah. Um, where we've just almost sort of sat down and worked it all out on a spreadsheet and said, yeah, we're going to produce this many mushrooms um, and we're going to earn this much from it and off we go. And you go ahead and do that. And actually you find out that growing the food is in some ways the easier part of it. Mm. And actually making sure you're selling everything you're growing can be more tricky. And if you're not careful, you end up growing produce and, and not selling it. So... Um, that's something to really bear a lot of thought towards is where are you going to sell the produce, who's going to buy it, uh, what kind of price are you going to get for mm -hmm. it. Um, not just that though, but also like, are there other producers in your area that are already producing that crop, um, have already kind of got the market covered. If so, then it's probably not going to be the best thing for you to do to, to start up and try and uh, go in competition with them. No, for sure. And the other thing that you want to take into account is like, well, what, what experiences have you got? How is that tied in with your desires to grow a crop? Are you interested in it? Um, I think you mentioned, do you want to do it part-time or full-time? But also, if you start something from scratch and you need to put all the infrastructure in place, 
and um, this ties back to the comment on the spreadsheet you know every time you plan something there's a lot of insecurity and uncertainty around that particular part and it can be quite disheartening if you quickly find that your plans are just not aligned with what's happening in in reality so i think it's a good caution be cautious in the approach and start small i think is a it's yeah, a good bit this of is advice. this is what we say to people all time and time again when mm. they ask about growing mushrooms. Our advice is not to think about going in from the start to make a full time business from it. It is possible, but you'll have to you know look towards sort of higher value products like mushroom grow kits or other ways of, of adding value to uh, the produce, which is the same with most of these food crops that we looked yeah. at. For for most people, it's going to make a lot more sense to start on a smaller kind of part time basis or sideline. Um, or even as a hobby, and just get a feel for everything that's involved in the growing as well as uh, marketing and selling the produce. And see if you enjoy it, see if you find a market for what you're selling, see if it works, and then kind of step up from there once you've got to that point. That's it. And it's just worth bearing in mind that it's not always about the money as well, mm. right? I mean, I know some people who are into market gardeners, and they're really good market gardeners, and it's not just about growing healthy food for them it's about growing healthy soil as well and that makes total sense to me yeah and connecting with people yeah. and and your community so there's a lot more uh, reasons to grow food apart from just growing it for yes. profit yeah um, for sure great so i hope you found this video really useful and interesting like we said it's a shame we couldn't give you a really clear -cut answer as to what is the most profitable crop uh, but certainly some things to think about and um, we hope you found it useful so if you like this video please subscribe to the channel and we'll see you soon